It's 4 p.m. on a Wednesday here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. We begin with the government's tax revision today aimed at boosting domestic demand. It is determined to breathe new life into the nation's sputtering economy. The move will motivate com companies to put the hordes of cash they've been sitting on back in the market. Jim young -il has our top story. The Park Geun-hye administration is proposing a tax revision, putting pressure on large conglomerates to use their cash reserves on investments, paying out dividends and raising the wages of their employees. Instead of hoarding that cash, the government would like to see it flow into households as a way to boost domestic consumption. Under the government's proposal for a tax revision that goes into effect next year, the government will provide a 5 to 10 percent tax deduction for companies that raise employee salaries, with extra incentives for firms that take additional measures. The dividend tax will be cut to 9 percent from the current 14 percent if dividend payouts meet certain targets. Companies with paid-in capital exceeding 48 million U.S. dollars will have to pay a 10 percent tax on their total cash reserves for three years if they don't meet one of the two targets, spend 60 to 80 percent of their net profit on investments, salary increases and dividends, or use 20 to 40 percent of their profits for salary increases and dividends. However, the idea of taxing the internal reserves of companies has not been met with kindly by the business community. They contend that many of the businesses have been setting aside earnings for a rainy day. Even if companies increase their dividends to avoid taxes on their cash reserves, they say the impact would not meet expectations for increasing domestic investment and consumption. Kim young Arirang News. The Korea Institute of Finance has revised down this year's growth forecast for the Korean economy to 3.9 percent, citing a slower-than-expected recovery that's 0.2 percentage points lower than its earlier forecast. The think tank attributed the downward revision to negative growth in the United States in the first quarter and weakening of China's economy. Sluggish domestic demand spurred by April's Seolho ferry disaster also played a role, but an official at the institute was upbeat about the second-half prospects for the current economy, citing the policies of President Park Geun-hye's new economic team and an expected recovery in developed countries. The world's two largest tech giants, Samsung Electronics and Apple, have decided to drop all of their ongoing patent lawsuits except the ones in the U.S. In a joint statement released on Wednesday Korea time, the two smartphone giants said the decision will apply to court proceedings in countries including Korea, Australia, Germany, Italy, Japan and Britain. Although the statement also says the agreement has nothing to do with any licensing arrangements, some analysts say the two are on the path toward a cross-licensing deal. The high-stake lawsuits between Samsung and Apple began in 2011 when Apple claimed Samsung's Galaxy smartphone copied the design of iPhone. Samsung responded by accusing Apple of stealing its mobile technology. In the meantime, Samsung knocked Apple off its perch in the highly competitive North America smartphone market thanks largely to robust sales of its latest flagship smartphone, the Galaxy S5 market. Research firm Strategy Analytics says Samsung's share in the market came to 36 percent in the second quarter. Apple dropped to second place at 28 percent. Industry watchers said the turnaround came as Samsung strengthened its sales with the Galaxy S5, while Apple loyalists delayed purchasing new devices as a new iPhone is expected to be released later this year. Korea's LG Electronics ranked third in the region, posting a company record market share of 12%. Now, the recent slowdown of exports to China is setting off alarms for trade officials here in Korea as China is Korea's largest trading partner. But the country's exporters may have found some unexpected help along the way. Our Kim ji reports. 
The rate of increase in Korea's exports to China is slowing as local Chinese companies are producing cheaper products. Up until now, a majority of Korean exports to China were in the form of intermediate trade, goods in which the finished product is reprocessed and consumed in the import country. Steel, machinery and petrochemicals fall in that category. It's why local media outlets in Korea have emphasized the need to diversify the country's exports to shift the focus toward consumer goods or products that can be purchased for use by the average Chinese consumer. Korean exporters have found an alliance TV dramas. Food products, cosmetics and beauty products from Korea have enjoyed increased demand in China thanks to the popularity there of Korean shows like You Who Came From the Stars and The Inheritors. The Korea International Trade Association says consumer goods to China from January to May this year increased more than 9 percent compared to the same period last year. Exports of seasoned dry seaweed or kim in Korean increased 300 percent in the first quarter after protagonists in Korean TV dramas were shown eating them. Likewise, exports of canned tuna increased 12-fold and Korean beer by 67 percent in the first quarter on year, promising signs for Korean industries who are trying to survive in the increasingly competitive global market. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. The head position of the National Police Agency had remained vacant after the agency's chief resigned over its failure to promptly identify the body of Yu byung on the fugitive owner of the sunken Teolho ferry. But the position will likely be filled soon. The seven-member National Police Commission approved the government's recommendation of Kang Shin Myung, the current police chief of the Seoul Bureau, this morning and put him forward as a single candidate to President Park Geun-hye. Now, meanwhile, the Chief of the Army, General Kwon Woo Sung, also stepped down to take responsibility for his failure to adequately deal with the death of a young conscript who was bullied to death by senior soldiers. That position has yet to be filled. And moving on to the Gaza Strip, where 72-hour truce that went into effect on Tuesday continues, Israel has reportedly withdrawn all of its ground forces. Israeli and Palestinian delegates are set to talk in Egypt in an attempt to seek for a more permanent solution. Our Connie Lee has this next report. The gunfire has gone silent in the Gaza Strip as the 72-hour ceasefire continues. But the clock is ticking. With the truce set to expire Friday morning, Israeli and Palestinian officials have been sent to Cairo for talks, with Egypt acting as mediator. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, speaking to the BBC, urged both sides to negotiate a two-state solution. Meanwhile, in the Gaza Strip, the three-day ceasefire is a brief window of opportunity for the residents to take in the devastation, stock up on supplies, and recover their dead. We found destruction everywhere. A mosque, Quran books, decomposed children were found under the rubble after five days. Public buildings that used to serve people were destroyed. UNICEF, the children's body of the United Nations, says more than 400 Palestinian children have been killed since the beginning of the conflict, with more than 140 schools damaged or destroyed in less than a month. Along with the truce, Israel said it has withdrawn all of its ground forces. But according to a military spokesperson, the troops are still on the border, ready in defensive positions. We are taking a defensive stand. We are there in order to prevent further infiltration and further attacks from Gaza, originating from Gaza. About a quarter of Gaza's population is now displaced, and more than 1,900 Palestinians have been killed in the month-long conflict. Connie Lee. I did on news. 
and North Korea's conventional weapons may be falling in the hands of Islamist terrorist groups. That's according to U.S.-based website 38 North. It raised that possibility this week, saying Pyongyang seems to be using Iran as a logistical link in the chain. The report states that Pyongyang has a historical and possibly continuing arms relationship with non-state actors in the Middle East, namely Hamas and Hezbollah. British daily The Telegraph has also reported that Hamas is negotiating a a new arms deal with North Korea. Now, weapons the two groups could buy from North Korea include AK-47s and ammunition, artillery shells, rocket-propelled grenades, anti-tank missiles, and surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The UN Security Council has issued a fresh warning to North Korea. It said more ballistic missile tests will be met with harsh consequences. In a meeting Tuesday, council members denounced the regime's recent launches and reminded Pyongyang that they were in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. The council did not specify the measures that would be taken, but they did raise the possibility of further sanctions if North Korea continues to flout its international commitments. North Korea has test-fired short-range ballistic missiles on seven different occasions so far this year. And former North Korea specialist for the U.S. State Department Joel Witt says there are a number of reasons explaining North Korea's recent behavior, which is becoming more confrontational. We had a chance to talk to him. Our Yudian has this report. North Korea has recently been even more belligerent than usual, threatening to launch a nuclear attack on the White House and South Korea's presidential office of Cheong Hwade. Joel Witt, an editor of 38 North run by Johns Hopkins University, says a number of developments are prompting North Korea's actions. There's first of all those North Korean threats. Secondly, there is what appears to be um, a deterioration in North-South relations. Third, you have the upcoming U.S.-South Korean exercises. And fourth, you have the Asian Games coming up as well. So all of these factors are in the mix, and the danger is the situation will deteriorate before the Games and result in some sort of provocation. Seoul and Washington are scheduled to hold two weeks of joint military exercises in mid-August that are designed to bolster joint defenses against North Korea. When asked about Seoul's growing relationship with Beijing on the heels of a bilateral summit last month, Witt said it hasn't had much of an effect on Pyongyang's stance. Chinese are still steering a middle course in dealing with North Korea, and they're not um, particularly supportive of either the United States or South Korea's stance towards North Korea. So I don't see any big changes coming out of that summit. China's position on North Korea may not have changed much, but Witt says Washington should alter its stance towards Pyongyang, citing a lack of any meaningful breakthroughs in U.S. North relations despite years of efforts. Witt called for a new tact. A new policy has to include diplomacy, such as engagement, but it also should include measures such as sanctions or even military steps to protect ourselves, because this is a very dangerous situation, so we need to use all of the above in dealing with North Korea. Arirang News. Now, the U.S. State Department says Washington, as it said many, many times in the past, views Japan's wartime sexual slavery as a serious violation of human rights. Our Shin Se-min has this report. The United States is urging Japan to resolve the issue of its wartime system of sex slavery and take responsibility for its past atrocities. We encourage Japan to continue to address this issue in a manner that promotes healing and facilitates better relations with neighboring states. The State Department confirmed a report on Tuesday that White House and State Department representatives held closed-door interviews with Lee yok sun and Kang Il-chul, two Korean victims of Japan's sex slavery system, to discuss their experiences. Emphasizing that it wasn't the first face-to-face -face meeting between the woman and U.S. officials, the spokesperson said Washington was open to holding similar meetings again in the future. It is deplorable and clearly a grave human rights violation of enormous proportions that 
the Japanese military was involved in the trafficking of women for sexual purposes in the 1930s and 1940s. Citing a spokesman at the U.S. National Safety Council, Korea's Yonhap News Agency also reports the two women met with the officials from the White House Office of Public Engagement. However, the names of the officials who met with the women have not been disclosed. Lee yok -sun and Kang il -chul are currently traveling around the U.S., taking part in memorial events remembering the victims of Japan's historical wrongdoings. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now moving on to the Ebola outbreak, concerns of the virus spreading to other parts of the world are growing. Health experts around the globe are putting their heads together to keep the Ebola outbreak in West Africa under control. Our Kim min -ji reports. The World Health Organization is convening a two-day meeting of its emergency committee starting Wednesday. A spokesman for the UN Health Agency said the main focus for the experts taking part will be the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and whether it constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. If they determine it does, the committee will recommend that the director general of the WHO declare it as such and that temporary measures are put in place to keep the virus from spreading internationally. The agency is scheduled to hold a press conference on Friday, Geneva time, on the outcome of the meeting. More than 1,600 have been infected in the current outbreak, and the death toll stands at 887. However, citing a doctor working in Liberia, CBS News in the United States reports that the actual death toll is much higher than the figures released by the WHO. In the meantime, Spain is repatriating an elderly Ebola-infected Spanish priest who had been working in Liberia. An Air Force plane will pick up Miguel Pajadas and bring him back to Spain for treatment. Pajadas, who has worked in Liberia for over 50 years, has been in quarantine at a hospital in the capital. Meanwhile, a second American victim arrived on U.S. soil on Tuesday. Nancy Reipel was flown in from Africa overnight and will be treated in the same isolation unit as Dr. Ken Brantley, who also contracted the virus in Liberia. Both Reipel and Brantley are reportedly recovering after taking experimental drugs. That has some of the world's leading Ebola specialists calling on the WHO to make the experimental drugs available to victims in West Africa. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. And with this outbreak topping most headlines in recent days, concerns that infectious diseases in general could spread to other parts of the world are on the rise. Our Kwon so -a gives us a rundown of which diseases to watch out for before embarking on a trip. No matter how slim you think your chances are of contracting a dangerous disease, prevention is always better than having to rely on a cure, especially as the world becomes smaller and people travel more. But even those who never leave the country can pick up something nasty, as there are more and more people catching contagious diseases in Korea. In fact, according to the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the number of measles patients this year stood at 410 as of the middle of last month. That's nearly four times more than the number recorded over the whole of last year. What's noteworthy is that only 14 of the 410 patients came down with measles abroad. Over 350 cases, the vast majority, caught it as a secondary infection in Korea. This is why taking the required vaccinations and medicine is so important. The most serious and contagious diseases are commonly found in Africa, the Americas and Asia. The yellow fever vaccination is mandatory when traveling to any country affected by the viral disease, while all the others on the list are recommended. Malaria, for example, which is mainly transmitted by mosquitoes, can be prevented by taking anti-malaria tablets before, during and after trips to affected areas. Unfortunately, there are still diseases that can't be prevented medically, as can be seen in the recent outbreak of the Ebola virus in Africa. The Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says basic methods such as washing hands thoroughly, eating cooked food, wearing long sleeves and staying away from animals give travelers the best chance of avoiding getting sick. Kwon so -a, Arirang News. Now, Pope Francis is set to arrive in Korea as pontiff next week. He will be in town for five days and is said to have arranged a meeting with the victims of the tragic ferry accident that occurred in Korea back in April. Our Son Jung-in has more. 
This will be Pope Francis' first visit to Asia since his inauguration as pontiff in February 2013. Upon his arrival on Thursday, the Pope is set to meet with President Park Geun-hye. As for the rest of his schedule, he will take part in a celebratory mass in Daejeon, where he will meet with around 20 youth representatives from 17 Asian countries. He will also attend the beatification mass of 124 Korean martyrs who lost their lives mostly during the 19th century under severe religious persecution. The mass will be the largest event during the Pope's visit to Korea, held at Gwanghwamun Square in central Seoul, with nearly 1,900 priests and some 200,000 Catholic faithfuls attending. The pontiff will meet with the Asian bishops in Hemi, located in the country's southwest region, followed by a concluding mass for the 6th Asian Youth Day. And Pope Francis is wrapping up his visit with the Mass for Peace and Reconciliation in Seoul, inviting nearly a thousand people, including former victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement during the early 20th century. The preparatory committee for his visit says he will also meet bereaved families and victims of the April ferry disaster upon the request of the bereaved families. We delivered the message immediately to Rome and received a positive response. We will be inviting families of the victims to a mass held on August 15. The Pope is expected to give words of peace and healing not only to the bereaved families but the entire nation. Son Jung in Arirang News. And as you just saw, the Pope has a beatification ceremony planned in his upcoming visit, but there's one person not on that list, one person whom many Koreans eventually hope to see added. Our Im Yoon Hee tells us about that person and his artwork. A heroic character in Korean history, Han jung gun sacrificed for the whole country when he took the life of the then resident general of Korea, Ito Hirobumi. But what some don't know is that An also had an artistic side to him, seen in this sign preserved through the years. It's one of his last works, created while in prison, and it reveals his devout Catholic faith, which he held on to until the very end. With the words, Respect of Heaven, written in traditional Hancha writing, An also wrote his name and left a handprint that's easily distinguished by his half-missing ring finger. An jung gun was given the death sentence on February 15th, but before that, many Japanese individuals went to An, requesting various different writings and signs. And that's how this particular sign came to be. It was originally in the possession of a prison warden. It found its way into the warden's son's hands and was then returned to Korea from Japan. An jung gun wanted more than anything to have peace in Asia, but he also always followed his faith. So this is actually a happy event. Last March, the sign failed to sell at an auction. But recently, the Seoul Chamun Catholic Church bought it and then donated the piece to the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Seoul. And now it's being put on display in hopes of catching the attention of a very special upcoming visitor. When the Pope visits this time, along with the beatification ceremony, An Jung Gun's life will hopefully be recognized and become a light for others. The sign will be on display at the Seoul Museum of History, and it will be available for viewing just in time for Pope Francis. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather update. Now we have rain in the forecast today for the central region, including here in Seoul as well as in Gangwon-do province. Now the amount of rain won't be much, but we are seeing a drop in temperatures because of the cloud covers. Now meanwhile, the regions down in the southern eastern provinces are fending off the heat. In fact, heat wave advisories are in, in effect with current temperatures at 33 degrees and higher, so try to avoid any outdoor activities if you can. Now, meanwhile, Typhoon Halong is slowly making its way towards Okinawa, Japan, and it should reach the southern regions of Japan uh, and have influence on, Korea, on the southern parts of Korea this weekend, so do keep that in mind when making plans. Now, going over to our temperature readings. Seoul will top out the Wednesday afternoon at 28, and meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will top out at 32 and 30 degrees. 
And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island will top out at 30 as well. Tokyo peaks to 28, while Mankangang tops to 18. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that's a wrap for now. Join me again at 6 p.m. Korea time for early edition at 6.